From where you sit in APS, what are our biggest barriers to equity? So obviously, I mean, I work in the division of equity and learning under post-secondary and workforce readiness. And so equity is a huge piece of what we do. Um, one of the things within our department that we talk about quite often is access to post-secondary um, opportunities. Okay. So um, that, that's a huge piece to equity, right? Is that are our students at the more affluential schools in our district um, accessing opportunities or experiences or knowledge that maybe some of our students at lower, um, less affluent or lower, lower socioeconomic groups, are they, is, is there equity in that? And so what does access mean to you? So access can be a, mean a variety of different things. So do they have access to know what the opportunities are for post-secondary credentials and learning um, as their high school student? Do they, do they even know what that means to take a concurrent enrollment class? Or do they know what it means to take an AP class mm. or an IB class? So there's an aspect of awareness mm -hmm. that is a part of access. There, and so if you, if you don't know what's possible, you don't know what the, right. um, the options are, then you can't access them. That's right. So if, you know the same as I can't buy a glass of lemonade if I don't know what lemonade is. Right? Or why would I want to buy that? Mm -hmm. You know, like, okay, my experience with lemons is that they're sour mm -hmm. and that they're yellow. So I have no idea what lemonade is, but I don't like sour things and I don't like yellow things. So I really don't want anything to do with that. But mm. if I know that lemonade is actually sweet and that it's cold mm -hmm. and that I drink it, I don't right. eat it, then maybe I, want, maybe I would want to access that. That awareness level... Nice. Goes up for me, right? And so we want to make sure across the board all students have the are aware so mm -hmm. that they can access what, what's available to them. And so once they are aware of it, then does access look different for different kids and I think so. And I think that um, I think that one of the big pieces that, that we need to be looking at, some of the barriers are the technology pieces, right? Mm -hmm. Do all students in our district, can they access um, some of the free, deep, deep philosophical ideas <laughs> that are just out there on the internet, right? Like, sure. I mean, there's like free classes they could take at Ivy League schools that they probably don't know about and our teachers probably aren't talking about, but there's these, there's such a wealth of information and education out there that we, I don't even know that we're talking about that. We're, dri we're just trying to drive these other conversations, some real basic things like, how can I get my freshman English course taken at the community college where I'm still a high school student? Mm -hmm. um, so to me, yes, that's a barrier, but like, are we, even, are we going beyond that? You know, are, we are we talking about, can we get to this point where in just a regular English class or a regular math class maybe, in a high school or even in middle school, all of a sudden we're digging into st to research that's been done in an Ivy League institution, or we're looking at you know the, the latest research from across the world and accessing journals, articles, or research, or some data that's been presented, mm -hmm. because that's to me that's what that's where our equity piece should be. Because you're using that, you're accessing essentially all of the tools at your disposal rather than just this smaller subset that right. you sort of predefined. Um, and you were before we sort of started recording, um, you were talking about essentially giving uh, giving someone a, a screwdriver and saying yeah. it's only only has one use. That's right? right. It only has this one use, but it could be used to hammer something in or yeah. to get yep. a weed out of the ground or uh -huh. like all of these different tools. Right. Um, I think about YouTube like that, right? Like if you only yeah. see it as a tool for finding entertaining cat videos or <laughs> or like music videos, right. then that's all that tool then is. Then that's for. all it becomes, right? And so and so that's an interesting thing you bring up cuz like YouTube even in my house with um, with my kids, for some of them, YouTube is about listening to music. All right, for other kid, for another child in my house, YouTube is about learning how to care for pets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, YouTube takes on a different meaning. It's the same tool, but it can be used differently. For me, YouTube mostly is about 
how do I fix my car or how do I fix something in my house that my wife wants me to fix that I'm having a hard time trying to figure out. Right. But YouTube helps me with that, right? And so, um, so this, I think we need to, how do we bring that into the classroom even more so that, mm. so that our teachers, so that the systems we have, even our, even our administration is saying, look at all of this great stuff we have. Yeah, we've got some of these post-secondary elements. We've got a great career technical education program over at Pickens. We even have some career and technical ed pieces at local high schools, which are great, and we should have access to that. What do we do when we have a student that doesn't fit mm -hmm. into mm -hmm. those categories? What do we do when we have a student that doesn't even fit into the category of, I want to go to college, but here's what I want to do, and we have nothing for them. And maybe this gets into like your personalized learning, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we may, even, we may not even have an expert um, in our whole entire district of how to connect that student or give that student the access they need to be able to further that. But what I would say that's it's a barrier, and yet, yet we, it's on us as mm -hmm. educators mm -hmm. to help facilitate that. And so. It's kind of like what we were talking about earlier, even though I may not be the expert in, in for example, video game designing, and we, I, I know we don't have a CTE program here for it. Mm -hmm. I know we don't have college courses that students can take in our district for video game designing. What can I do to try to figure out how to help that student that wants to do that and is serious about it? Yeah, well, and I, to me, uh, sort of what you're talking about is not just what are the tools inside of school for, right? Like what is YouTube for? Mm -hmm. or what is this writing uh, uh, and sort of learning? Like what is that for? But it almost expands it out uh, to say, well, what is school for? Right. Right. Like, and so the the barrier there is that if school is not for preparing for college, mm -hmm. right? If school has to be for something else, mm -hmm. do we? But can we provide access to that? Can right. school be for more than just preparing someone for college? Exactly, and that's what, and I think that's where the shift has to come. And if, you know, and I'm going to take a little liberty here because we're talking about the sphere of, of my job position. Mm -hmm. um, but if you really start looking at root causes of what barriers are to those types of things, it gets, to, it, it really does get down to stereotyping students. Mm -hmm. It gets down to our own personal biases. It gets down to, so you were an English teacher um, previously as an educator, and I'm sure that like you entered the classroom and you had moments where like your biases were just like coming out, and then there were times when they weren't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that we have to just acknowledge that that's what happens to us. Even those of us who have like gotten these district positions, we still come in with our own bias, and that sometimes leads to a stereotype. And sometimes, sometimes it's racial. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's social. Sometimes it's um, intellectual bias and stereotyping. There's all types of different things. We have to be aware enough of what we have as a bias, so that we're not mm -hmm. preventing access. So that I don't look at the student who I don't really identify with, or who doesn't who just doesn't gel with me as an educator and go, well, I just really don't get that student and how can I really, I can't really help that student. I, I've never been able to help those types of students. We, that's what we need to get away from and get to a point where we can go, I need to tap into that student, right? I need to let go of my stuff and be able to say, to better serve them. How can I better serve you, right? Because I know, and I think that it may be as simple as starting with like, Who's not doing well in my class? Mm -hmm. You know? Right. Who is struggling in this? Who's struggling in my class? Because as an educator, um, and I, I've never been a teacher in K-12. I've taught college classes. And even in my college classes, what I would talk to students about is, if you're not doing well, you're not meeting the expectation of the class, what do we need to do to get you to move forward? And yeah. sometimes that's just, there's, a, there's so many strategies to do that. But... Why spend my time on the people that are getting it and totally absorbing it and doing well without any extra intervention on my part? I really shouldn't have to do much for them. I should be focused on the group 
that obviously there's some equity issues, right? Mm. Because they're, there's not, they're, they're not connecting with the material, they're not connecting with me. Maybe there's something else going on in their life that's preventing them from being able to move forward with this. So, you know, when I talk about equity, I think that there's, there's this huge piece of access in general to a whole larger world. Yep. But I also think that we as gatekeepers, because that's what we are, <laughs> as educators, we decide what students get and when they get it and how they get it. And if we can't, if we can't regulate ourselves, then we become the equity barrier. So yeah. So there is this aspect of uh, of personal responsibility mm -hmm. for equity, right. right? And so being able to look at our own biases and uh, identify and dismantle uh, those and mm -hmm. or leverage them in some mm -hmm. <laughs> some ways mm -hmm. uh, to to better support all kids. And then you're also looking at the sort of more systemic access mm -hmm. issues, right. and so you know, just because I I you know get rid of my biases or, or mm -hmm. something like that, I still haven't solved for the access issues, and so exactly. you do have to do both of those things. And right. I, I hear you you talking about that. I think you've tackled this question pretty well. Um, <laughs> I'm going to ask you one last sure. thing, which is, what do you think we should be asking? as a system? What's the mm -hmm. question that either keeps you up at night or something that mm -hmm. you feel like you've been grappling with mm -hmm. um, that, uh, that you think we should really be tackling as a system? Um, that's a, I mean, that's a good question. I think that I could probably give you a lot of different answers. Um, so I'm going to try to be concise. Um, I think that the thing, I think as a system, the thing that we need to do better at or that we maybe need to address more is um, is how how do we just how do we get back to the basics of just being passionate about students? <laughs> okay, I'm just, and I and I really mean that because I think that like there's I think as we grow older as adults as we get as we get more stuck in the way that we like to do things because it's comfortable for us, I think what we need to, to take a step back at, and I have to do this personally too, is like, why did I go into education in the mm. first place? Like, why are, we need to ask ourselves that more, you know? And if I can, if I truly go back to that, like, I didn't go into it because of the money. I didn't get into this profession because I wanted to climb the ladder of education. Like, that's not why I got into it. I definitely never thought I'd work for a school, like in a central office school district sure. position. Um, but if I ask myself, I got into it because I wanted to make an impact on the lives of, our fut of the future leaders of our country. Like I, and and I, know that it's, I know that in my sphere of influence, it's not going to be a large number of students. I know it's going to be probably relatively small, but how do we get the meaning back into teachers and help them be passionate about, and, and it is not just teachers, it's principals, it's counselors, mm -hmm. it's the registrars, it's the support people, the custodians, it's everybody. How, why did they choose this environment? Mm -hmm. And when we can answer that, we can say, and hopefully we get to like, it's that impact piece, right? It's the impact that even if what I'm doing is just a small thing, many ripples, many ripples create large waves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, I, and, and so I don't know how to tap into that. I no, know. but by asking the question mm -hmm. of how is it that we can be passionate about our kids? Mm -hmm. How is it that we can um, really invest mm -hmm. uh, in them and have impact and look at why mm -hmm. we chose this profession, why we continue to come into work every day, and where our passion is, yeah. right? And activating that passion. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of value in looking at how can we be passionate about the things our kids are passionate about? Yeah. How can we be passionate about learning them, or learning uh, how to support them better, or um, really understanding them even mm -hmm. better? 
Mm -hmm. Because I think that that goes back to our, our initial conversation right. around equity, right? Like, if we understand them better, we can better serve them. Mm -hmm. If we are passionate about them, we will serve them better. Yeah, and as a result of getting to know them and knowing who they are and being passionate about what they're passionate about, we start breaking down the barriers mm -hmm. that are preventing equity, and we actually get to more rigor, more engagement, and we get to those things that t traditionally, as an education system, we look to as indicate as markers for success, right? Mm -hmm. Higher test scores, which is always like, how do we get higher test scores? <laughs> well, if we can if we can figure out how to be passionate about what we're doing every day with our kids and connecting with them, you know, we and tie that into educational context, we're gonna get there. We'll get there. But the question is, how do we, how do we, how do we develop that culture? Mm -hmm. I know it's not out there. I've seen it because I'm out in schools. Yeah. And so I see it. Um, so I think by an asking that question and really striving for an answer, I think that we we get a lot closer. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate your time. Thanks, Ben. Thank yeah, you, sir. Thank you.